Throughout the last few weeks, when, when we selected Mr. Bob York as our speaker, I got to know some about him from, from Jose and also in talking with Bob York. And uh, that's one of the true joys of being a Rotarian. We, we get to learn about and meet some of the great people from Mount Carmel that, you know, that I might not have otherwise met. In a, in a game now where there are specialists for everything, uh, we have pass rushing specialists, short yardage backs, possession receivers. Bob York was, in the 1960s, a specialist for Mount Carmel. He was our kicker. And in 1968, he kicked 43 extra points, which was the most uh, in a season for the Big Red since 1921. Uh, in 1954, he helped Mount Carmel go through its first Excuse me. In 1968, he helped Mount Carmel go through its first undefeated season since 1954 and was the first of three straight Southern Division championships. The 43 points uh, ranks fourth today, and his 72 PATs ranks third today in Mount Carmel history. He passed uh, the great Wally Deal, who had 60 extra points. Bob also was a, participated in track for the great Jerry Breslin. He was a high jumper and he established a new school and stadium record with a six foot two inch high jump in 1969. He played second in district four and won the first ever state indoor track championship in 1969. His talents took him to East Stroudsburg University. He was an eight time letter winner, four times in football, four times in track. For East Stroudsburg, uh, he was a kicker. He helped lead the team to a 21 and 18 record over his four years with 17 career field goals. He had a long of 42 and a 35 yard game winner against Lafayette. He finished second in the Pennsylvania Conference in punting in 1972 with a 40.2 yard average. He continued running track at East Stroudsburg as I mentioned and he, he had best of a six foot, six and a half inch high jump, 21 feet four inches in the long jump and 43 feet eight inches in the triple jump. His specialties have, have taken him to new heights. He was recently inducted as a, a Hall of Famer in the Ed Romance Hall of Fame. Currently, Bob lives in Westchester with his beautiful wife, Janice, and his son, Cody, who graduated from Penn State University. Bob is a sales manager for Zep Manufacturing and has been doing that for 34 years. And Bob is one of the three people who donated that, that scoreboard, or the score, the uh, win total that sits above the, the stadium. The, the thing that reads 827 wins, Bob helped uh, pay for that and, and we appreciate it. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bob York. Can't believe I did all that. Stunning. <laughs> Let's see. I'm with you in a minute. Here. <sighs> Gentleman named Jim Valvano. This was set for Mike's height. Um, <laughs> gentleman named Jim Volvano coached uh, NC State to a NCAA championship back in the, uh, in the 80s. Um, dynamic guy, got cancer right away, went on ESPN, the first ESPYs, and made a speech that just blew the house away. And they asked him, they said, what do you, when you talk to people, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do? He said, I want to make them laugh, I want to make them cry, I want to make them think. Now that's, that's a pretty tall order, but we're going to take a whack at that. I'm going to be the guy crying, so I got that covered. If you guys throw a few laughs in there, we'll probably get this thing going. Um, this whole thing started for me. To get to this podium, you're going to hear this story. It's crazy to me when Jose called me to, to speak here. It's, it's an unbelievable honor. 1962, so we're going to take you back. You players were, you know, in the cloud. Um, 1962 at the MOC Hall. It's the... Uh, Big hall, they don't use it anymore, I don't believe, opposite the viaduct, so if you know the building I'm talking about. And here comes the, uh, the Mount Carmel football banquet, which then was treated, by the way, as the Oscars. It was the day of the year. We were getting huge speakers, and the town just couldn't wait. Uh, teams were good, uh, but this was about tradition, and this was about the speaker, believe me when I tell you. So they start the program, 7 o'clock, 8.30, quarter to 9, they're done. Speaker's not there. Outside, a raging blizzard. I mean, stupid blizzard, all right? So we're sitting there and we hear word that he just flew into Harrisburg and the state cops are gonna bring him up to the banquet. Going, oh my goodness. So everybody now has talked to everybody as much as they can. 
My father took me to this banquet. It's the first one. He worked for the Mount Carmel item when we had our own newspaper, if you remember that, you old guys. And uh, that building is opposite Visentainers, so that's the building that used to be our newspaper. And uh, he brought me, and for an hour and a half we just sat there. 400 people, all in rows, not round tables like this. Nobody ever missed this thing. Sometimes they ran out of tickets. Imagine this building sitting there, dead quiet like you guys are now, for an hour and a half. All of a sudden, the doors open, and it was an old school building where the doors opened to the outside. There was no lobbies, there was no coat check. Open to the outside, and boom, flashlights are going outside. The state cops are here. They're dropping a the speaker off. Two Smokies come in. If you guys know state cops, they're huge. Everyone must have been a tackle back in the day. They come in, snow on the hat, the whole thing, and here comes the speaker in between them. I mean, the crowd went crazy. I mean, it was just like Elvis came into the building. Now, this may get lost on some of the younger guys. I hope not, but the older guys will know. The speaker was Jimmy Brown. Jimmy Brown, in those days, it was Jimmy Brown and Johnny Unitas, and that was the end of the story for anybody you wanted to talk to about pro football. The place went crazy. He had snow on his head. He's brushing snow off. The crowd's on their feet. I have no idea what Jimmy Brown said that night. None. <laughs> I, I, I don't. And you guys might not remember a thing I said. But all that being, being said, he talks for 15 minutes. I got to shake his hand afterwards because my father worked for the newspaper and a little bit in the sports department. And I was just on cloud nine. This was my first banquet then. I was 11 years old. I've been to probably 10 or 12 since then, counting this one. So the next day, all right, I see my Uncle Leo downtown. Now, I said to Uncle Leo, I'm all excited. I said, Uncle Leo, I said, someday maybe I could be the speaker at the Mount Carmel football banquet. And he called me Little Bobby. He said, Little Bobby, I have to be a cold day in Carmel before you're the speaker. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uncle Leo uh, wasn't the brightest guy in the world, although I did get here. Uh, he was probably right until about five minutes ago. Uh, but he, he would have to stand on a chair to touch stupid. I mean, he was not a bright man. So he, every time he came over for Christmas, he would mention that you'll never be the speaker. So Leo, Leo, whichever way you're going here, <laughs> you know, we made it. Basically, I just want to talk about a very powerful force on earth. It's, it's really the reason I'm here. You heard my dad took me to that banquet. It's fathers and sons. We, we, football is so ingrained with fathers and sons. The guys who stood up, I don't know, I don't want you to raise your hand. How many of you played because your dad, you know, he'd like you to play. You know, he doesn't want you hanging out. He wants you to play so he can sit in the stands and look at a guy in red square touchdown and go, that's my boy. That's part of the father-son gig going on. And 21 years ago, I think you guys were here last uh, year, Mike Higgins, Dr. Mike, gave the talk. Wonderful. I mean, I, I can't say enough good things about Mike. I wrote an article called Closing the Circle when Mike finally scored that touchdown back in the first championship game. And for all Mount Carmel's bravado, all the stories, all the wins, the big game, we're the big red, we never want to stay title. It's good to have those stories. That they're, they're all terrific, but we never want to stay title. So I said, Mike scoring that eight-yard touchdown in quadruple overtime or whatever it was, that closed the circle of Mount Carmel football. We had one on the board. We didn't know we were going to take off and win a whole bunch more, but we had one on the board. He closed the circle. Well, what I want to do today is, is close that circle with my father taking me to these banquets, you guys taking the time, the effort out of your lives to be a big red. It's a lot of time. I mean, you guys, any of you guys lift weights at all? Is that part of the deal? Okay, just checking. All right. So at any rate, we're going to talk a little bit about fathers and sons and closing the circle. But before I get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Here's how old I am. Mr. McPhee's father took my baby pictures. <laughs> Honest to God, it's true. And uh, Jose was the guy. I'm sure he was instrumental in getting me behind the mic here today. He, he's the one who called me about speaking. And uh, I guess he was very candid. He said, Bob, I called two gentlemen to speak. They're both deceased. And uh, <laughs> I'd like to ask you. So I, I took it as a compliment. I was third, right? <laughs> so and then the, the two mics, we got Smith and Wojtovich, all right? They somehow got involved, calling me every 17 seconds that I was going to actually show up. And uh, Mike Wojtovich said, now, you know, you're old. Do you need any special food, soft diet, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And he said, I said, no. I said, I think I can get through. And then, as Mike referenced, referenced it earlier, he likes to hear from the old guy. He said, you're going to tell old stories? You're an old guy. I'll do some. I'll tell some old stories. I promise you. So I, I guess I wasn't exactly uh, you know, filled with glory with those two invitations. But I do want to clear something up real quick about him reading my bio. 
You know, he said I was a kicker and I did this and I did that. Actually, I was the best kicker in the world. <laughs> you know, so they, they left that out. It's a little short. I kicked 43 extra points or whatever I did. I was the best kicker in the world. And I know this because after my first game in 1967, my mother said, you're probably the best kicker in the world. <laughs> so it's official, all right? <laughs> and then sometime maybe during or after our honeymoon, I have two other bests in the world. So having a speaker with three bests in the world ain't a bad deal. My lovely wife said, you're the best husband in the world. So that was 32 years ago, but that counts. So I'm the best kicker and the best husband. And when he was five, my son, who couldn't be here today, we'll talk a little bit about him as an honorary tornado, gave me best father in the world. So yeah, that's pretty good. So you got, you got three bests going on, so that's pretty good. Uh, I did write this list down. And as I wrote it down, I got, I got more embarrassed as I was writing this list down. You know, the first speaker for this banquet was a guy named John Heisman. Heard of a little trophy he came up with, you know? John Heisman was doing this. I'm now doing this. You guys got really screwed, you know? Uh, the, the four horsemen of Notre Dame were speakers. Now, it's a little old for you, but these were the best backfield ever assembled back in the day. Norm Van Brocklin took the Eagles to two titles in the Hall of Fame. Jimmy Brown, as I mentioned, I mean, insane. Um, Joe Paterno was the speaker at my senior banquet. Don't remember a thing he said, but I was there and it was Joe Paterno, all right? Chuck Bednarik, Hall of Fame from Bethlehem, the Eagles. Joe Theismann, Dick Vermeil. Uh, the list is just nuts. Bruce Arians, coaches the Phoenix Cardinals. Jason Garrett, coaches the Cowboys. So the, the list here is nuts for a small little town that wins a bunch of football games and then brings somebody in to speak that's just, you know, world, world class. The only advantage I have over them is I'm one of you. I grew up where you grew up. I went to Knobles. I went uptown and got a hamburger. I chased Mary Sue, you chased Mary Blue. You know, <laughs> it's, it's the same. I grew up like you guys grew up. So I have a little bit of insight into who you are, what you're up to, where you're going, what you're thinking. I won't tell your parents any of that, but I kind of have an idea, all right? So since I'm taking the place of people like John Heisman, I thought I would mention, by the way, we, they talked about you guys having a, a real nice year. I personally know that Loyal Sock, Central Mountain, Shimokin, Central Columbia, Lewisburg, Danville, Warrior Run, all lifted weights, watched film, ran up hills, did their best, went to meetings, got pep talks, and you beat them. Right? They do the same stuff too, all right? and you beat them. And you change the sign, we'll get to the sign here in a minute, but you change the sign seven times. And I know last year Mike made a big deal about the sign, that the 1950 team had one win, but at least they changed the sign by one. And that's true. You picked the worst team in the history of the world, by the way. It one win. I mean, who would you beat? Uh, but that being said, you change the sign seven times. And we came up with the idea for the sign by sending it to Bart Matucci's. Where else would this possibly happen? And my son, who was young at the time, Coach Iwanek. Did you guys have Coach Iwanek in your careers? He's yeah, a scary guy, isn't he? Scary dude. <laughs> scary dude. Anyway, Coach Iwanek and John Halkovich, who was a player back in the day. And uh, we're sitting at the bar, and I said, you know, we're the winningest team in Pennsylvania. We don't tell anybody. I mean, what's this, like a secret? So I drove through Minersville to get here today, and they got a sign bigger than the world saying they're the best Class A high school girls softball team in Pennsylvania. I said, softball? It's crazy. Let's get a, a sign up on the, on, on the press box. I had a guy in Jersey who was a buddy of mine design it. It had to be designed, or right now it would be laying in the field with this wind. Right, so we designed it. My son's art class made it. The toughest part of it was getting 300 bucks out of Halkovich. Brutal. <laughs> Brutal. Put the sign up, tried to pull it up there with a cord and an Iwanix truck. Almost killed ourselves. Dennis Hepler said, let me get a crane from Coltmont. We did the next week. Put it up there. It's been up ever since. If Greg Sikavich is here, Greg, fix that light. I put a light up there that goes on. Fix the light so it shines at night. I always had a dream. You'd drive by there any time, day or night, and it's saying 842 or whatever the number is. So fix the light, I'll throw you 25 bucks. Fix the light. <laughs> so that, that, that's the story of the sign, and that's what we all had in our heart when we got through with this program. It just changes you. I mean, we're all in a, in a crazy club. The winningest school in Pennsylvania, wearing red. Who wears red? I mean, I went from Mount Carmel red to Stroudsburg red. That could never happen. It's impossible. Red is not that, that prevalent. But I'm going to tell you this story, and I've never gotten through this story without crying. I hope to do it because I've practiced is in our championship year, we finally won the Southern Division. And my dad used to walk me, I lived on Maple Street, 
my dad used to walk me down to the stadium, and there's a little rock down there that sits by the street sign. So the next time you're down, look at it. I'll bet you've never seen it. It's about yo big. My legs are this long, so I'm really tired when I get there. You know, I'm four years old. And he'd tell me tornado stories. He'd tell me about the 1954 team and all the guys were on this team. And I was in. I was, I was a Mount Carmel zombie. This, this is how I got here today. I got zombieized by my dad, who dropped out of school in eighth grade, went to work for the item, and just idolized you guys. Idolized big high school athletes who got to go to school, got a diploma, and went on. He thought you guys were the bee's knees. So I got this from him. Lo and behold, we go undefeated that year, and we go to this legendary Eastern Conference Championship game. This, in Mount Carmel, again, there's a dividing line here. The young guys are going, what are you talking about? And the old guys are going, wow, the Eastern Conference. I get it. But this was the biggest thing in the world. We're playing in Scranton. It's on TV. Crazy. So we go down to Byzantiners. We have a little breakfast, a little team breakfast. We think we're all hot shots. We're like the pros now. We're going to have breakfast. We're going to go on a bus. It's crazy. We all got outside the bus. They took a picture. My dad was down to see us off. He walked up the hill on Maple Street and died of a heart attack. So here's the number that has to do with that. This is all he wanted to do was have his son play in this game. He lived for 29,374 days. He needed to live for 29,375. He was one day short. So next time anybody in this room bitches and complains about a day 30,000 days, he was one day short of seeing his son playing this game. It broke my heart. It's 50 years later. I'm still talking about it. Obviously, it rung a chord with me. I can't tell you how many games my son and I, and he couldn't be here today. I wanted to close that circle not only with my father, but with my son, father, father, son. He couldn't be here today. But between 1994 and let's just say 2006 to draw a, a drawing point, my son and I, from Westchester, and he went to school in Wilmington, so we're stretching it even farther, came to 138 Mount Carmel football games. So somebody owes me cash money. <laughs> this, this is a ton. This trip now that I'm older, it, it's longer. Did they move Mount Carmel or what? It's forever to get here, all right? We saw you guys play last year, the opening game, which happened in my high school class reunion, and I saw you another game uh, during the season. Saw you win both, which, by the way, brings, I, I'm going to sneak this in. This isn't enough in the flow of what I'm doing here. But let me see what we got here. Where's, where's the kicker guy? Kicker guy. Stand up. Stand up. Tommy, stand up. All right. Is your snapper and your holder here? Can you have him stand? Go ahead. We won't hurt you. Stand up. All right. Guys, I got to tell you, I kicked for 10 years you know, on real teams, and then I kicked in the yard. I never saw anybody come in and play for 10 minutes and have three game-winning kicks. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Tommy, you got ice water in your veins, and you can't do it without those two guys, because I know. I had a bad holder one year. I almost got assassinated. I mean, <laughs> you just can't have it. Nobody takes it easy on a kicker when he hasn't swung his foot yet. It's open duck season, all right? So I'm going to give you the international sign that you give all kickers, holders, and snappers that they'll appreciate. <laughs> Sit down. By the way, in a, in a weird twist of events, my dad dropped out of school in eighth grade, goes to work for the item, you know, works his way up through the ranks. And along the way, it's an all Polish-speaking family. I mean, both my grandfathers died of black lung. As I said, I'm you. I, I'm, I'm a picture book of you. And he changed his name. His name was Francis Yorka, because I certainly knew I wasn't English uh, with York. He changed his name to France, from Francis Yorka to Frank York. And I think that had something to do with working at the item, and he thought that would be a better name and, you know, those kind of things. So my lovely wife for Christmas had my heritage done, where you can look back through and see everybody. Where'd you come from? What did you do? So my real name would be Roban Francis Yorka. And, you know, I'm still going to be Bob York, I guess, till the end. But it's just neat knowing that that would have been my name. If you're going to come from an ancestry, you know, and you know your name. I mean, I'm not making this a, a, a change from Mike Smith to Pete Galinsky, but, <laughs> but I am making a change, and just in my heart, it's good to know. And when we put that sign up on the press box, and I'm going to say this to you guys, maybe one of those things you're going to forget, I always thought it would be neat to leave a footprint. When I go, I want to leave a footprint. You know, what did this guy do? Well, I don't want to say putting the sign on a press box cured cancer. It certainly didn't. It's a neat thing. I like it. Hopefully my footprint was being a 
Best husband in the world, right? Best? Okay. Uh, good father. Uh, speaking of good things, I'm also going to introduce somebody who also drove up here today from down in the area. And my medical history is an absolute shambles. It's, it's a joke. I'll run it for you real quick so nobody throws up. All right? In 1998, I've cried three times in my life. In 1998, the doctor told me, he said, Bob, you have kidney disease, you have polycystic kidney disease, you're going to need a kidney transplant. I went out in the parking lot and cried like a baby. I said, this is, this is the worst. I mean, I'm trying to be a father, a husband. I've been a good guy, I guess, and this is the worst. So I cried, and I went on dialysis. By the way, if you have some time on your hands, dialysis is for you. It takes about 10 hours a day. Have a nice day. So I'm on dialysis for about six or eight months, and I get a phone call from a guy who sang at my wedding. Janice and I got married, and we said to the pastor, we said, do you have anybody sing for 50 bucks? He said, yeah, I got a guy. He's singing the two classic wedding songs, you know, everybody loves everybody, blah, blah, blah. And we meet him afterwards. Guy likes to golf, like guy likes to drink beer, guy likes football, we're in. We got a guy, all right? Stayed in touch with him and played in one golf tournament a year with this guy, all right? One. So I'd see him once a year. He calls me, I'm on dialysis, to see if I'm playing in a tournament this year. I said, Steve, I don't know if I can play. I said, uh, I'm on dialysis, I'm waiting for a kidney transplant. I'm not leaving any sentences out here. He says, I'll give you a kidney. <laughs> what? So, guess what? Had the tests, gave me a kidney. He's my best friend who's not female. All right? <laughs> and I'd like him to stand for one second. Greatest guy in the world, Steve Merritt. <laughs> my son couldn't be here today, it's a shame. Steve is kind of a proxy, he's my new best friend. You're tied with Cody, tied with Cody, okay? To be fair to Cody, I gotta, you know. <laughs> but the far reach of Mount Carmel, and, and, and these two stories are, are just too bizarre to believe. We're in an island in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, tropical island, you know, the whole deal. It's raining crossways, all right? But somebody in our family has to have a chocolate bar. I'm not gonna say who. Was that? No, it was me. Yeah, look at her, you'd think it was her. No, it was me. And we get in the car, there's no Wawa's there, there's no 7-Elevens. You're driving around looking for Victor's house of stuff, you know? We go down this little dirt road, we get to the end, there's a little shack there, and I mean a shack. There's no cars, we go in, there's one light on. We go into the place, we're not three steps in, and the guy says to me, say hi to Jazz, you guys beat Pottsville this year? Are you kidding me? We're in the Gulf of Mexico on an island? He said, no, nah, my brother used to hang around Mount Carmel, we got to know Jazz, I follow him, blah, 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 did you beat Pottsville? And I said, I'm on vacation, I don't know. <laughs> but I'll assume we did, because we got 842 wins. Mount Carmel, right? I'm sitting in a, in a business meeting on the 30th floor of Amtrak in Center City, Philadelphia. And big table, and we're going to go over bids, and we're going to basically try to sell them stuff. That's how I make a living. So we're sitting there going to go over these bids, and I'm about two down from the head of the table. That guy isn't there yet. And naturally, I somehow work Mount Carmel into the conversation. Because when you bring Mount Carmel up, they go, Mount Carmel, football. Now, there's good people in every town, I get it. Uh, pretty girls, handsome guys. But Mount Carmel, football. So I'm talking to this guy, he gives me the Mount Carmel football deal. And all of a sudden, the main guy gets to the head of the table and says, don't I hear Mount Carmel? I said, yeah. He said, you go to Mount Carmel? I said, I did. He said, you know, my college roommate was from Mount Carmel. His name was Joe Baczynski. Do you know him? And I said, Joe, absolutely. Joe was the franchise. He wore 19, he was Johnny Unitas to me. And he says, yeah, he was my roommate, great guy. He said, I came to Mount Carmel once. He said, I always remember Joe. Joe had passed away recently. He says, I always remember Joe. And he says, uh, what are you here for? I said, I sell such and such. He just gave me the look. They're now my biggest customer, Mount Carmel, okay? <laughs> Mount Carmel, it's just a, a crazy deal. And a few people have asked me before I spoke here today, said, Bob, you know, yesterday being Valentine's Day, can you tell us, you know, can you give us any help with women? So, did you say that, Mike? Can you say, give us any help? <laughs> okay. Well, somebody did. It wasn't Mike. Somebody will look like, maybe the other Mike. And I basically, I said to him, no, I can't. I can't give any help with women, and I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why you don't want this help, and why the parents don't want me to give you any help. Is, I'm in another business meeting in Philadelphia, the Marriott, and the guys are sitting around a table, 1982. All my stories are old, guys. Bear with it, okay? <laughs> 1982, and they said, man, you should see this girl in national accounts. She is something, all right? So 
What do guys do with information like that? They file it. We all file it, guys. You know, you saw a girl from Elysburg, Knobles, file it, all right? So it's in there. February 11th, 1983, it snows 27 inches. I've called everyone I know in the world, all right? I said, I'm gonna call that girl in Atlanta. I heard she was pretty, I'll call her. We're on the phone for two hours. We get along great. She's from Statesboro, Georgia. It's snow up to my, you know, boop, boop. And I said, uh, why, why don't you come up? And she says, no, why don't you come down? So I fly down on a thousand mile blind date, get off the plane, thought I was being punked. I said, this girl needs a blind date with the Polish kid from Mount Carmel, really? We get along great, we have a great weekend. She takes me to the plane Monday morning and I say, I love you. She says, you're crazy, get on the plane. <laughs> I do, I get on the plane, we talked that week and I said, I'm sending you a ticket, you gotta come up, playing away game, come on up. She said she would. She gets off the plane, Delta Terminal E6. Still remember it. We talk about it all the time. All the businessmen getting off the plane. I bought an engagement ring. I got down on my knee. I said, would you marry me? She says, yes. And I said, you're crazy. <laughs> this past Wednesday, we were married for 32 years. <laughs> Guys, it was easy, really. There's there no heavy lifting for this. But but that being said, this is why parents don't want to know this. Guys, don't do this. The, the chances of you meeting a girl in three days and getting married, Vegas doesn't even have on a board. I mean, it's just, it ain't happening. Don't do it, okay? That's my advice. If you want women, Wikipedia. You know, <laughs> some, they'll tell you something in there. So I've got the crazy kidney from the guy that I saw once a year. I got the three-day wife going, okay? <laughs> So I got a kidney transplant. Lo and behold, I come up to Mount Carmel for a funeral. Red Roof Inn in Danville. I can't say enough bad about him. Uh, yeah, probably get sued. Anybody from Red Roof Inn? Yeah. Uh, anyway, I get a concoction of crazy infections, and I go into a coma. So people talk all the time about, hey, that guy's in a coma. I was in a coma. 17 days, I'm in a coma. Got the whole oil, the last rites. The doctor said, can't do anything. My wife's going crazy. She's calling the CDC in Atlanta. They're doing this, they're doing that. Finally, she decides, not the doctor who gave up, she decides they're going to change a drug. Maybe this drug is doing it. They change the drug, and at 4 o'clock in the morning on the 17th day, she's home sleeping, I come out of the coma. Now, I've lost 30 pounds. I'm all black because my skin has died, okay? They broke my eardrums, putting me in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, so I can't hear. I can't see, however. The nurse sees that I'm up, and I look in the hall, and all the orderlies are exchanging money. Half the guys thought I'd die, the other half thought I'd live. <laughs> so it was like, it wasn't big money, but you know, it's money. So that being said, they're gonna call my wife, it's four o'clock in the morning, get down here. She says, your husband's out of the coma, it's unbelievable. So the nurse says to me, they're cleaning you up because you've been not good while you're in a coma. She says, you wanna watch TV? Sure, <laughs> who doesn't? You know, you get out of a coma, you know, watch a little TV. So here's what I'm watching at 4 o'clock in the morning, University of Pennsylvania Hospital, Spartacus. Really? I mean, so I'm watching Spartacus. Janice shows up. We cry like babies. It looks like I'm going to live, I guess. It took me forever to get better. This woman, out of 32 years, has probably been my caretaker for 16. It's, it's a stupid amount, which is another reason to never marry anybody <laughs> in three days. She's just been a saint. Steve with the kidney has been a saint. Coming from Mount Carmel. You know, we heard this young man talk about loving Mount Carmel and coming back and helping Mount Carmel. Guys, 140 trips up here, a sign. My son had a, had a small operation. They gave him some sort of anesthetic. I hear him in the back screaming, pounding his chest. There's coal in my heart. He thinks he's from here, you know? <laughs> and basically he is. Anybody who's, who's spent the time that he did coming up here with me. And if there's fathers in the room talking about fathers and sons, spending four hours, four and a half hours with your son, over 10 years, priceless. I heard about everything you could hear about that a kid would have. And you guys would be first to admit the tables. Did you guys tell your parents everything? Probably, okay, <laughs> you probably did. <laughs> All right, so I got to know everything and we bonded like you can't believe. Uh, again, sorry you couldn't be here today because I'd point to him and embarrass him a little bit more. But all that being said, as we come down the home stretch here, but wait, there's more. Uh, just to tell you about our family, we're a family of faith. We believe in Jesus Christ. That got us through a tremendous amount. I mean, this can't be all there is. The, the, the buffet was wonderful, but that can't be all there is. And that got us through a tremendous amount. 
when I met my wife, she had already been saved, and that simply means that as an adult, when you know what's going on, you say, I accept Jesus Christ. So I'm not here to proselytize, I'm just telling you what works for us. And two little twists in my life that you just, or one little twist actually, I should say, is I get out of college. And by the way, going to college, well, you, I don't know how many of you guys are going to college, just wait. No, just wait, I'll tell you that. <laughs> At any rate, I go, to, I go to college, East Stroudsburg. I'm a kicker, they think I know what I'm doing. I get there, my father had passed away. My mom and my pastor drive me up. We get to East Stroudsburg, and I thought, you know, they're gonna have football practice today, you'll probably have like some snow cones, you know. Then you'll get practice a little bit, maybe take a picture, it's picture day, something like that. We get up there, guys are getting on a, the world's oldest bus. I said, what are we doing? He says, oh, we practice uh, in Quantico, Virginia with the Marines. I said, the Marines? He drove down, no air conditioning in his bus. It's a million degrees in Quantico. We practice 10 days with, with the Marines, living in bunks. Let me tell you, Marines are serious people. You know, they're not necessarily enchanted with college guys, all right? Uh, and freshman kickers, they love. They just love freshman kickers. <laughs> love them. So, at any rate, we do that, and I said, man, this isn't what I expected. End up having a real nice career, made a ton of friends, which is really what it's all about. It's nice to do good. You certainly want to win games. I came from Mount Carmel to three years. I was two years on the varsity, and when you're hanging around the varsity, lost three games in three years. We lost three games my first month. It's just a different experience, the, the enthusiasm. I mean, a couple thousand people show up and da-da-da-da. Now, Carmel, they want to know how your foot is, your leg, did you break up with your girlfriend? I mean, it's just another level. They put us on a fire truck when we're going to this Southern Conference Championship game, going down Oak Street, crowds, you know, knee-deep. Where do you get that? You can't buy that. You can get it in Mount Carmel. You can't buy it in Minersville. If we all played in Minersville, there wouldn't even be a banquet now. We'd be at the girls' softball bank. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that it's probably, you know, politically, whatever. But let me be the first guy to tell you, maybe not, but maybe, it's really tough out there. I mean, it's really tough. As you get out, and I'm really addressing the guys a lot, but gals too, it's tough. You guys are in the bubble, the Mount Carmel bubble. I was in it. God bless you. It's terrific. You're worried about this much stuff. And then here comes this much stuff. So if you ask your parents about making a living, the first thing they'll do is go, oh, you know? Uh, lawyers don't have to worry about that, but most people do, <laughs> all right? But anyway, it really is. As you get out of this bubble, just get ready, because I have a, 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 a something I profess to everybody that I'm around, and poker brought this term to life, and it's all in. You've seen guys take their chips. They're going all in. They're just, I'm winning or losing. This is my gig. So, I just suggest to everybody, girls, guys, old people, whatever the case may be, whenever you decide to do something, go all in. Because when you go half step and you don't make it, could you have made it? I don't know. Maybe you could have, maybe you couldn't have. And if somebody laughs at you, whatever your little goal is about going all in, and they don't go all in in anything, when you're better off down the road, you can go back and say, I went all in, you didn't. Can I have fries with that? Okay? <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's really that simple. And you guys, and, and this is my, also my little invention, the metaphorical bucket, people have put goodness into your bucket from playing high school football games, from being a nice son, from, from helping an old lady across the street. They've put drops of goodness into your metaphorical bucket, which is up here. Because pretty soon, people are gonna start taking goodness out of that bucket. There are people who don't know you, people in college, coaches, whatever the case may be. So that bucket's a two-way street. Keep filling that with goodness. When people say a good thing to you, boom, it goes in a bucket. So when you get hit hard later, you've got some water to spare in that bucket because you never want that sucker to go dry. It's tough to take it from dry to good, all right? So don't let that bucket go dry. Tough stuff coming up, go all in. You know what's better than a 3-0 in college? A 3-2. <laughs> and you can extrapolate that any way you want. Being in one club, you know what's better? Being in two clubs. You can't do enough. I interviewed guys for years. They come in dressed like they're my paper boy. What are you doing? Come in, dress for the job you want, not the job you have, okay? If I see one more guy with jeans and Reeboks on, I'm gonna puke. Guys, dress, we have a professional job going on here. I asked one guy, and this is a standard interview question, get ready for this. I said, what books have you read? This is the craziest answer ever. He said, all of them. <laughs> 
I don't have a comeback for that. <laughs> you know, I said, you're, you read every book in the world, you're hired. You've got to be like a genius. You know, so get ready for interviews. They're real stuff. Professors, real guys. There's no more grade grubbing going by and say, hey, can I cut you one? No, you're, you're not doing that wherever you're going to school. And if you're staying here and you're going to be a tradesman, you're going to make more money than the college guys anyway, but go all in. Because you know what's better than being a good carpenter? A great carpenter. You're going to make more money. Money is good because when you get sick, you can give it to doctors and lawyers. It's a circle. Okay? And uh, I don't even know where I'm going here. And, and semi last but not least, I try not to give what I call a license to ruin my day. I only give it out to so many people. Certainly Janice has one. She knows me. She's the love of my life. She can certainly ruin my day. Steve, kidney boy Steve has one. If he says, Bob, you're screwing up, this isn't like you, he has the power to ruin my day and make me stop and think. All right? Jose, half a license. Uh, Dave Clayman, the other half, if they get together and both say, Bob, you know, you're not doing it right, whatever. Don't give it to everybody, because now you let somebody who doesn't even know you. These two guys right up front here, hey, you're a lousy guy. You're going to go, how can he say that? Don't even know me. That's the thinking. If they know you and they say that, don't let everybody ruin your day. I'm in sales. People could ruin every day that I have. But if you don't give them the license, they can't ruin it. And this is last. Is there's a school down outside Philly in the suburbs called Malvern Preparatory Academy. It's just like it sounds. It looks like Harvard. It costs 30 grand a year. They have an ice hockey team. They have a rowing team. They go to England to row, by the way. Just like Mount Carmel, very similar. Uh, and my friend is the assistant ice hockey coach at Malvern. And he's talking to his players at the beginning of the year, just getting to know them, what are your goals, whatever. And he said, Bob, can you come over? I'd like you to, to talk to these guys and, and give them a little bit of you know, sales, this, that, and the other thing, just to hear what they have to say. So we're going through the list. These are rich guys' kids, OK? And the first guy wants to be a lawyer, and the next guy wants to be a doctor, and this guy wants to make a lot of money, and this guy's going to own a fleet of this, and this guy's going to be a pro of this. And it's all standard stuff, and it's not bad stuff, necessarily. But this one blew me away. We get to the last guy in line, and it turns out that he's not one of the rich guys. They give scholarships. So he's, a, he's on an ice hockey scholarship. So he said to him, what's your goal in life? This is a mind bender to me. He said, I want to be the best son. I want to be the best father. I want to be the best brother that I can be. Wow. If you guys do that, and that doesn't even matter the age. I try to do that every day, be the best father. I can no longer be the best son. Both well, my parents have passed. But you guys have that opportunity. It's a God-given opportunity. If you'll do those things, if you'll be the best son, father, husband, you got it made. The rest will fall in place. That'll help you leave that footprint. That'll fill that bucket for you. So in the words, this is a famous song lyric, in the words of that great, great band, Steam, which you've heard many times, in 1964, they wrote, na 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 na, na 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 na, hey, goodbye. <laughs> this is for you, Dad.